Hello and welcome to Zoology 142. This is our third major lecture on the circulatory system. Today we're going to be looking at blood vessels and hemodynamics. And we're going to cover the structure and function of blood vessels, that is the arteries, the arterioles, the veins, venules, and even the capillaries. We're also going to discuss hemodynamics, which is the process of maintaining adequate blood flow and blood pressure to the tissues of the body. And we're going to discuss some disorders associated with the cardiovascular system, including shock and hypertension. We are not going to discuss major circulatory routes. This is why I have an asterisk here. I do want you to read about these in your textbook, but you're going to be tested mainly on circulatory routes and the names of various blood vessels in lab. So be sure to read pages 717 to 746 in the ninth edition of your textbook. So before I begin to talk about blood vessels in this lecture, I just want to reiterate some of the stuff we went over in last lecture. Remember we talked about the cardiac output, which was basically the amount of blood that the heart can pump in a single minute. Cardiac output can be determined by multiplying the stroke volume times the heart rate. And so if you have somebody at rest with a normal resting heart rate in the 70s, you're going to get a cardiac output somewhere around 5 to 6 liters per minute. On the other hand, if you put that person under extreme exercise, for example, playing a basketball game, their cardiac output can increase to well over 17 liters per minute. And so this ability of the heart to increase cardiac output to meet metabolic demands is called our cardiac reserve. And remember that people that are more healthy have a greater cardiac reserve than people that are less cardiovascularly healthy. So for example, you might have an elderly patient that gets winded just going to the mailbox, and that would be because they have a low cardiac reserve. On the other hand, you might have somebody that can play a pickup basketball game and not even break a sweat, and that's because they have an extremely high cardiac reserve. Okay, so there are three major types of blood vessels, and we're going to talk about each of these in some detail. The first of these are arteries. These are muscular blood vessels that help to carry blood away from the heart to the tissues. Remember, this is the technical definition for arteries. A lot of times people think that arteries carry oxygenated blood, but as we saw in the last lecture, this is not true for all arteries. For example, the pulmonary artery carries oxygen deficient blood, but all arteries do carry blood away from the heart to the tissues. Arterioles are special types of arteries. They're basically small arteries with walls that are less thick, and their job is to connect the arteries to capillary beds where exchange of nutrients takes place. So capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, and they are the sites of gas exchange and nutrient exchange between the tissues of the body and the bloodstream. And capillaries tend to be very tiny, very numerous, and have very thin walls to help facilitate this function. The third type of blood vessels are veins. Veins convey blood from the tissues back to the heart. And remember, we said that most veins are oxygen deficient, but one exception here is the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins actually help to convey oxygen-rich blood from the lungs back to the heart. Veins in general tend to be conveying lower pressure blood than arteries, and so they don't tend to be as thick. And of course we have venules, which are tiny veins that help to connect capillary beds to larger veins. There's also something called vasovasorium. These are small blood vessels, including arteries and veins, that help to supply and drain blood from the cells in very large arteries and veins. For example, if you imagine the aorta, it's a couple millimeters to maybe five millimeters thick in places, and the walls in there are so thick that the tissues within those walls cannot get enough oxygen just by simple diffusion. So these larger blood vessels themselves have minute blood vessels that supply their metabolic needs. Okay, let's take a look at a simple diagram that shows the distribution of the three types of blood vessels. Remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart, and oftentimes this blood is high in oxygen. And so arteries, for example, would be carrying blood to the tissues so they could be oxygenated. Arteries tend to be thick-walled because they're dealing with high amounts of pressure. Capillaries, on the other hand, are very small, minute blood vessels, typically less than one millimeter in length and they are very thin-walled to allow for movement of substances across the capillaries into the tissues. For example, oxygen will be dropped off into the systemic tissues and carbon dioxide will be picked up by the capillaries and returned to venous circulation. The third blood vessel here is our veins, and remember veins carry blood back to the heart. Veins are usually dealing with very low pressure blood, so they tend to be thinner in diameter, and most of the time they're carrying oxygen poor or oxygen deficient blood. The small vessel you see here connecting the vein is actually a venule. Remember, venules drain capillary beds and connect to larger veins. The previous slide shows a rather simplistic view of the circulatory system. This slide is a little bit more comprehensive, so let's take a look. 
Let's start out with a heart. The heart is a muscular pump which forces oxygenated blood through the arterial circulation. First we go through elastic arteries which help to regulate blood pressure and even out the highs and lows in blood pressure. And then we get to the muscular arteries. These are called distributing arteries and they have a thick muscular layer that helps to regulate internal diameter and this can also help to regulate blood pressure. Some of this blood will be diverted to arterioles and arterioles feed the capillary beds. And the capillaries, of course, is where exchange of gases and nutrients are taking place. The blood is then drained from the capillary beds by venules. Venules are tiny veins which connect with larger veins. And these larger systemic veins help to eventually bring this blood back to the heart where it can be pushed to the lungs again for oxygenation. A fourth component we haven't talked about so far are the lymphatic vessels. And one of its principal functions is to suck up any residual fluid in the interstitial spaces and put it back into venous circulation. We'll talk more about the lymphatic system in another lecture. Okay, so let's take a look at arteries. Remember, arteries were vessels that carry blood away from the heart. And because this blood is usually high in pressure, most arteries have to be thick-walled to withstand the hydrostatic pressure generated by the heart. Some of the arteries, in fact, are a little bit elastic. That is, they have an elastic-like compound in there that allows the vessel to expand and contract. And this helps to even out the highs and lows and blood pressure when the heart is contracting and relaxing. And finally, all arteries have an adjustable diameter. They have a nice thick layer of smooth muscle that will contract in response to vessel injury or in response to sympathetic nerve impulses. For example, if your blood pressure starts to drop below safe levels, your brain will send sympathetic nerve impulses to the arteries and they will cause these arteries to contract, thereby raising blood pressure back up to safe levels. Both arteries and veins are comprised of three principal tissue layers. And these are called tunics. A tunic just means layer or shirt. The first layer is the internal layer called the tunica interna or sometimes called the tunica intima and it is composed of simple squamous endothelium. This endothelium ensures that blood has a nice friction-free surface over which to flow so that we won't have any inappropriate blood clotting. The next layer is the tunica media and it is composed of smooth muscle fibers and the purpose of the tunica media is to adjust the lumen size of our blood vessel in order to maintain blood pressure and regulate blood flow. And finally, the last layer is the tunica externa. The tunica externa is a very thick layer composed of elastic and collagen fibers. Now, I said before that arteries can be under immense pressure. I want you to think of an artery as sort of like a fire hose. If you've seen a fire hose up close, you know that it has this nice, tough fibers covering made up of canvas. And that covering itself is not waterproof, but the purpose is to keep the internal rubber layer from bursting under the extreme pressure that's generated inside the fire hose. And so by the same token, the tunica externa is there to prevent the artery from bursting by the extreme pressures that are generated during ventricular contraction. Now arteries can be divided structurally and functionally into one of two types. The first type is an elastic artery. Elastic arteries have a large internal diameter and contain elastin fibers and less smooth muscle within their tunica media. They basically function as pressure reservoirs because the elastic tissue within the walls allow the vessel to stretch when the ventricles contract and then also allow it to recoil when the ventricles relax. So a good example of an elastic artery would be the aorta. And so take a look at the picture at right. You can see that as the ventricle contracts, the blood is being forced up into the aorta, and this is distending the walls of the aorta. After the heart starts to relax, the walls of the aorta then will reflexively contract. So having this elasticity does two things. It prevents vessel injury due to overpressurization, and it also helps to smooth out the peaks and dips in blood pressure that happens when the heart contracts and relaxes. The second type of artery are muscular arteries, sometimes called distributing arteries. These are medium-sized arteries with very thick walls. In particular, they have a thick muscular layer and also a thick tunica externa made up of connective tissue. In comparison to the elastic arteries, muscular arteries have a lot less elastic tissue and more muscular tissue. And because they have more muscle tissue, they are capable of a greater constriction or dilation of the lumen. And this constriction and dilation of lumen helps us to regulate the flow throughout the blood vessels and also helps to regulate blood pressure.
This slide shows the structural differences in the three different types of arteries. You can see that they all have about the same amount of endothelium, and remember the endothelium, or the tunica intima, was there to give a friction-free surface over which blood can flow. But now let's take a look at the elastic tissue component. You can see that elastic arteries have the greatest amount of elastic tissue in their vessel walls, and this is because elastic arteries must expand under the immense forces generated by the heart and then reflexively contract. In contrast, muscular arteries and arterioles have very little elastic tissue. Now let's take a look at the smooth muscle. Both arteries and arterioles have some amount of smooth muscle, but the smooth muscle tends to be greatest in the muscular arteries, also called distributing arteries. And that's because these vessels can more easily regulate their diameter to help assist the body in maintaining adequate blood flow and blood pressure. Finally, let's take a look at the fibrous connective tissue component. The fibrous connective tissue component is greatest in the muscular arteries, and that's because they have a small diameter which can actually increase blood pressure, and so they have to have this tight covering to help keep them from bursting or expanding too much. So because arteries are carrying high pressure blood, we can use them to determine your heart rate or pulse. If you remember last time, we talked about determining the heart rate by listening to the heart using a stethoscope, and this is called your apical pulse. However, you're not always going to have a stethoscope, so sometimes you might need to use one of the peripheral pulse points. And here you can see one of nine different pulse points that can be used on the body. For example, you might walk into a patient's room and they might be asleep, so you might just want to use their wrist to get a radial pulse. Now, ideally, the radial pulse and the apical pulse should be the same, but not always. For example, if we have a patient with a compromised cardiovascular system, we might get, let's say, a heart rate of around 65 at the heart, but a heart rate of around 55 at the radial artery. And this would indicate a pulse deficit. That is, the patient has dropped beats that aren't showing up at the peripheral pulse points. And this is very dangerous because it indicates compromised circulation. So it's always a good idea to determine the heart rate both using a stethoscope and also by palpating some of the peripheral pulse points to see if there's a pulse deficit. Now, because arteries are under high pressure, we can get to some defects and disorders that aren't found in the other two blood vessel types. The first of these is an aneurysm, and an aneurysm is a swelling or dilation of an artery that occurs due to increased pressure or the weakening of the vessel walls. In this case, the artery's walls will bulge outwards, become weakened, and can eventually burst. And this can lead to a catastrophic loss of blood. Although we show aneurysms happening here in the aorta, they can also happen in other blood vessels, for example, in the blood vessels of the brain. Another type of disorder associated with arteries is called an aortic dissection, and as the name implies, this is something that tends to be unique to the aorta. Now remember, the aorta was an elastic artery, so it was an artery that would expand and contract with the pressure generated by the ventricles. Well, sometimes the walls of the aorta can break down a bit, and basically blood can get out from the central lumen of the aorta and get in between the layers, let's say between the tunica intima and the tunica media. And that blood can basically cause a tear between adjacent layers and tear further and further down the aorta until it eventually bursts. And again, this loss of high pressure, high oxygen blood can be catastrophic and lead to almost immediate death. The funny thing about aortic dissections is that they are very difficult to detect. If anybody remembers John Ritter, he was a TV star that was famous on Three's Company and also had some bit roles in the medical comedy Scrubs. Well, he went to the emergency room with some nonspecific symptoms, some nausea, some pain, and they treated him as such, thinking that he had maybe the flu. But over the course of the next few hours, it became apparent that he had, in fact, an aortic dissection, that the blood had actually gotten between the tunica intima and tunica media and was ripping down the aorta until it found a place to burst out. Unfortunately for John Ritter, they didn't detect this in time, and so he died as a result. And so it's important to know that arteries, whether we're talking about the aorta or other arteries within the body, are prone to some unique injuries because they are carrying high-pressure blood. And so now we're going to move on to our second blood vessel type, the capillaries. The capillaries are the smallest and most numerous blood vessels in the human body. You literally have thousands and thousands of miles of capillaries in your body. And they are very thin-walled, and the reason they're thin-walled is because their primary role is to exchange materials, for example, gases, nutrients, and hormones, between the blood and the body tissues. There are three different types of capillaries the continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoid capillaries. And these capillaries basically vary in the degree of permeability, and we're going to talk about each of these in some detail.
Okay, the first type of capillaries we're going to look at are the continuous capillaries. The continuous capillaries are the least permeable and most common capillaries in the human body. For example, they're found in skin, muscle, and elsewhere. And they're called continuous capillaries because the capillaries have a nice continuous covering with no breaks in it. And the internal layer of this capillary, like all blood vessels, is made up of endothelial cells. And between these endothelial cells we have tight junctions which prevents leakage. There's also a nice continuous basement membrane covering the endothelium. And so in comparison to the other two capillary types, continuous capillaries are the least permeable. And so we tend to find them in areas of the body where we want to regulate what moves in and what moves out of the capillaries. For example, we would find continuous capillaries within the brain. There we have specialized tight junctions between all the cells in the capillary, and it strictly regulates what moves in and what moves out of the capillary. And this keeps harmful substances from getting into the brain from the bloodstream. This is why we call it the blood-brain barrier. The next type of capillaries are called fenestrated capillaries. In Latin, fenestre means window, and so these capillaries have large fenestrations or windows which increase capillary permeability. And we tend to find these capillaries in areas of active absorption or filtration, for example in the kidney and the small intestine. So imagine what the function of the small intestine is. It's there to absorb all the nutrients from our food and put them into our bloodstream so that our cells can use those nutrients. And so we have to have these special pores in the endothelial walls which readily allow passage of nutrients from the interstitial spaces into the capillaries. Okay, the third capillary type is going to be the most permeable and these are called sinusoid capillaries. Sinusoid capillaries have an incomplete basement membrane and they also have large pores or breaks in between the cells that readily allow for transport of nutrients and substances into and out of the capillary. We tend to find these in organs such as the liver, bone marrow, and spleen. If you remember back a couple lectures, we said that one of the functions of the spleen was to recycle worn out blood cells. And so we actually have cells that sit outside these capillaries like macrophages and they will literally reach in and grab a hold of these red blood cells, rip them apart and pull them out so their components can be recycled. So in order to do this we have to have a blood vessel that's very very porous in order to allow things to move in and out of the blood vessel readily. So if you remember from a couple slides back, I said that capillaries were in fact the smallest blood vessels in the body. They typically have a length of one millimeter or less, and their diameter is around eight to ten microns, which is just larger than a red blood cell. Despite this small size, we have many more capillaries than we do arteries or veins, and so as a result, we have a much greater overall cross-sectional area of capillaries than we do arteries or veins. This has a tremendous effect on blood pressure. That is, as blood goes through arteries and then to arterioles, we can still have very high pressure blood, but as we reach capillaries, that blood will tend to lose pressure and also slow down in velocity. And this in part is because that capillaries have a tremendous overall cross-sectional area, around 4,500 cubic centimeters. That's around five feet square. And that's a tremendous area, and so the big picture here is that as blood passes through capillaries, it loses pressure and it also slows down. A few slides back I talked about vasomotion. If you remember, vasomotion was the movement of blood into capillary beds, and that this blood is transmitted to the capillary beds by arterioles and then meta-arterioles. A meta-arterial, or thoroughfare channel, is a bypass route that blood can take through a capillary bed without actually going through the capillaries and so passage of blood into the capillaries themselves is restricted by special valves called precapillary sphincters. And these sphincters oftentimes are closed but can open up during nervous stimulation or through the activity of certain hormones. For example, if you take a look at the top figure, you can see that the capillary sphincters are open. And this is letting blood into the capillary bed. On the bottom figure, you can see that the precapillary sphincters are closed. And basically this is forcing all blood to take the bypass route through the thoroughfare channel. And this alternate opening and closing of capillary beds through precapillary sphincters is called vasomotion. So now we're going to take a look at capillary exchange. Remember that the primary function of capillaries is to exchange nutrients and gases between the blood and the tissues. And there are three different ways in which the capillaries exchange these nutrients. The first of these is by simple diffusion. That is where substances diffuse down their concentration gradients traveling through the lipid bilayer of the capillary cells and the fenestrations or intercellular clefts. For example, carbon dioxide, oxygen, glucose, and certain hormones will pass directly through the capillary cells into the interstitial spaces. So in order to use diffusion, we have to be either very small or we have to be lipid-soluble.
but not all things transmitted by the bloodstream are both small or lipid soluble so larger things have to pass through the process of transcytosis this is where we have passage of large lipid insoluble materials across the endothelium via tiny vesicles through endocytosis and exocytosis for example insulin and antibodies both of which are amino acid or protein based pass into and out of the bloodstream using the process of transcytosis and finally the third and probably most important process is something called bulk flow and this is the movement of fluids and solutes in response to pressure gradients from high to low and this pressure is generated principally by the heart but also by the colloids within the bloodstream because bulk flow works on a larger scale it tends to be faster in its rate of movement than either diffusion or transcytosis and it's the most important mechanism for regulation of relative volumes of blood and interstitial fluid and there are two different components of bulk flow filtration and reabsorption the first component of bulk flow is filtration this is the pressure driven movement of fluid and solutes from the blood capillaries into the interstitial spaces so at left you can see a blood capillary made up of endothelial cells and you can see there are gaps between those cells and that the pressure generated by the heart or hydrostatic pressure is forcing some of the fluid out as well as the smaller electrolytes you can see that the things that aren't forced out are the larger proteins in green and also the blood cells there are two pressure components involved in filtration the first and most important of these is blood hydrostatic pressure abbreviated as bhp and this is the pressure generated by the ventricles of the heart as they contract and force blood through the arteries arterioles and finally the capillaries the second of these forces is the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure or ifop remember the interstitial fluid is the fluid between the cells and there are some solutes out here as well and solutes tend to have a sucking force and so they help to pull things outside of the blood vessel into the interstitial spaces it should be noted that ifop is really insignificant and that the major pressure component here is blood hydrostatic pressure again the pressure generated by the heart as it contracts and pressurizes the blood within the arteries and capillaries the second component of bulk flow is reabsorption Reabsorption is the pressure-driven movement of fluid and solutes from the interstitial fluid back into the blood capillaries. That is, it's going in a direction opposite of filtration. The principal pressure component involved in reabsorption is blood colloid osmotic pressure, or BCOP. BCOP is caused by the presence of large proteins, for example, albumin, within the blood capillary. Albumin acts as a solute, and remember what do solutes do? They suck. They tend to suck fluids back into the blood vessels once the hydrostatic pressure from the heart has been lost. And so net filtration pressure, or NFP, is the balance between these two forces, filtration and reabsorption. Remember the two forces favoring filtration were blood hydrostatic pressure and interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, whereas the force favoring reabsorption was blood colloid osmotic pressure. And so there's a special law called Starling's Law of the Capillaries, which states that in most capillaries of the body, the volume reabsorbed is nearly as large as the volume filtered, and so we don't tend to lose large quantities of fluid through the process of filtration. But there are some exceptions. Edema, for example, is caused by an abnormal increase in interstitial fluid that occurs when filtration is much greater than reabsorption. And here you can see this person at right, and you can see there are two legs. Their right leg is normal size, whereas their left leg seems to be swollen tremendously. And this is because of the process of edema. Basically, blood plasma has been forced out of the capillaries to become interstitial fluid, and this interstitial fluid has accumulated in the interstitial spaces, causing the swelling. Now, there are various causes for edema, one of which can be excess filtration. For example, people that have hypertension are going to have a higher than normal blood pressure, and higher than normal blood pressure translates into a greater blood hydrostatic pressure, and this results in much more filtration than reabsorption, which can lead to edema. Another factor which can cause edema is increased capillary permeability. For example, certain allergic reactions can release histamines, which make the capillaries more permeable, resulting in increased filtration. Another cause of edema could be inadequate reabsorption and remember that the principal force driving reabsorption was BCOP or blood colloid osmotic pressure and the principal force giving us our BCOP was our blood colloids that is our albumin remember that albumin is a protein made in the liver and it acts as a solute helping to draw fluids from the interstitial spaces back in the bloodstream but what happens if we don't make enough albumin well we don't have enough reabsorption and so people that have liver damage and have reduced quantities of albumin in their bloodstream 
will oftentimes have reduced reabsorption, and as a result, they may have edema in various areas of the body. Okay, now we're going to talk about veins. Veins is the third type of blood vessel, and remember that veins carry blood back to the heart. So veins have the same three layers that arteries do. That is an outer tunica externa, made up of connective tissue, a middle layer called the tunica media, which is made up of smooth muscle tissue, and an internal layer called the tunica interna, or tunica intima, composed of simple squamous epithelium. So they have the same three layers that arteries do, but the big difference here is the layers tend to be a lot thinner. And that's because veins tend to carry low pressure blood, and so the coverings don't have to be as thick. Another big difference between arteries and veins is that veins have one-way valves that allow blood to travel only in one direction. And that's because blood is traveling so slowly through veins that it tends to want to go backwards. And these valves prevent blood from going backwards and keep it traveling in the direction of the heart. And this enhances venous return. So here's a slide that shows the histological difference between arteries and veins. Remember histology was a study of tissues, and so if you're in lab this week, you'll probably take a look at arteries and veins through the microscope. And so on your left you have an artery, it's a big thick walled vessel, and you can see that the lumen there is sort of squiggly. It can be more circular, but here it's squiggly, and that's because of the large amount of smooth muscle tissue within the tunica media. On the other hand, if you look at the vein, it tends to have a much wider lumen, but this lumen will not be circular. It'll be more collapsed, and that's because the walls of veins are typically not as thick, and this is because veins do not have to support the large amounts of pressure that arteries do. So the big picture here is that arteries tend to be more circular, tend to have thick walls, whereas veins tend to be more ellipsoid and have thin walls, but very large lumens. So here's another slide comparing the abundances of the different types of tissues within capillaries, venules, and veins. As you can see, that capillaries are made up exclusively of endothelial tissue. There's really no elastic tissue, smooth muscle, or connective tissue. On the other hand, if you look at venules, it does contain endothelium along with a little bit of smooth muscle and fibrous connective tissue. There's no elastic tissue present because there's really no pressure within veins or venules. And finally, taking a look at the veins, you can see that they do have a larger fibrous connective tissue shell, followed by smooth muscle and a little bit of endothelium. There is a little bit of elastic tissue, but not much. Remember, veins are principally low-pressure blood vessels, and so their walls don't have to be as thick or contain as much muscle tissue or fibrous connective tissue. Now, we said before that one of the things that makes veins unique from arteries or capillaries is the presence of one-way valves. And these one-way valves are very important because they keep blood going in a single direction, that is, back towards the heart. And the reason that we require these valves is that the blood pressure in veins is very, very low. And the reason it's low is that the hydrostatic pressure generated by the heart is going to be lost as we travel through the capillary bed and come back out on the venous end. So on the venous end of a capillary bed, the blood is very, very sluggish. So the blood really has no pressure left over to help push it back to the heart. And the force actually driving it towards the heart is something called the skeletal muscle pump. And the skeletal muscle pump happens because these veins, which have one-way valves, do cross several different types of skeletal muscle in the body. And as we fidget around and these skeletal muscles contract, they squeeze these veins, and because there's one-way valves, the blood continues to move in one direction. And so this keeps blood moving back to the heart, which encourages venous return. So just like we had small arteries called arterioles, we also have very small veins, which are called venules. So venules are very small veins that connect to capillaries, and the middle layer, the tunica media, only contains a few smooth muscle cells. And the endothelium of these blood vessels tends to be very porous, which readily allows for diapodesis, or movement of white blood cells, out into the surrounding tissues. So one common disorder associated with veins is something called varicose veins, and this is a disorder you've probably seen before. Varicose veins are basically twisted in large superficial veins, which we see in the legs and other places in the body. And the reason they become enlarged is because the valves begin to leak, and so the walls of the blood vessel become distended as blood tends to pool in the lower extremities. So common sites we can see these, besides the lower extremities, we can see them in the anal canal, where they're known as hemorrhoids, or also in the esophagus, where they're known as esophageal varices. And treatments for varicose veins include things like sclerotherapy, radiofrequency endovenous occlusion, and laser occlusion, as well as something just called surgical stripping. 
Now, because veins are such large blood vessels in diameter, they tend to house the majority of the blood in the body. That is, when you're at rest, around 60% of your blood volume is either sitting in veins or venules. And this is important because it makes veins an essential blood reservoir for the human body. And it's a reservoir that the body can call upon in times of need. For example, if you're exercising, vasoconstriction and skeletal muscle pump will help to force a lot of this blood from the veins back into arterial circulation where it can help to circulate oxygen and other nutrients to your body. So the big picture here is that veins contain the majority, or around 60% of the blood in the body, whereas arteries and arterioles only contain about 13% of blood in the body. Now, because veins carry low-pressure blood, we also tend to use them for collecting blood samples and administering medications. The first of these techniques is called venipuncture, and in the process of venipuncture, we use a needle to pierce a vein in order to collect a peripheral blood sample. We call this a peripheral blood sample because it's away from the heart. And again, the reason when we look at this peripheral blood sample is, for example, to see how different organs in the body are doing. We can look at kidney function, liver function, etc., by looking at various components in the blood. And we collect this blood at a vein rather than an artery because there's less risk at doing venipuncture than there is in puncturing an artery. We also use veins for the administration of drugs and IV fluids. The abbreviation IV means intravenous, and as the name implies, we're introducing a fluid within the lumen of a vein. And so IV fluid administration is a great way to get fluids into your patient, especially if they don't want to consume these fluids uh, because they're unconscious or they're in surgery or they're just not able to swallow. It's also a good way to get drugs and therapeutic agents in the body because by injecting them in the bloodstream, they can have an effect more quickly than if somebody had taken the medication orally. So now that we've taken a look at the general anatomy of the circulatory system, we're going to go back and look at hemodynamics, and that is the factors that affect the flow of blood throughout the body. And there's four main factors that affect blood flow. These include blood pressure, vascular resistance, venous return, and blood velocity. And we're going to talk about each of these in some detail. So one factor affecting blood flow is blood pressure. And blood pressure is important because it's probably the most easily accessible indicator of blood flow. So blood pressure is generated by the heart as it contracts, forcing blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta. And so there are two different components to blood pressure. The first of these is the systolic blood pressure. Remember, systole means contraction. And so systolic blood pressure is the pressure in the peripheral arteries when the heart is actually contracting. Whereas diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the ventricle is relaxing or filling with blood. And so a good systolic pressure is around 120 millimeters of mercury, whereas a good diastolic pressure is around 80 millimeters of mercury. We also have a third measurement called pulse pressure, which is simply the difference between the systolic and diastolic. So if our systolic pressure was 120 and our diastolic was 80, our pulse pressure would be around 40 millimeters of mercury. And finally, there's a fourth measurement called mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is simply the diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure. And mean arterial pressure is probably the most clinically significant measurement of blood pressure because it tells us most directly about perfusion or blood flow to the tissues. And we'll talk more about mean arterial pressure in just a couple of slides. Now, as I said in the last slide, because blood pressure is probably the most easily measurable indicator of blood flow, we tend to use it to assess the blood flow of our patients. And so if you come into a patient's room, you'll often see somebody applying a sphygmomanometer or blood pressure cuff to that patient's arm in order to determine what the systolic and diastolic blood pressures are. And so here you can see a patient's arm, and the blood vessel that carries the blood to the hand and the fingertips is going to be the brachial blood vessel. And remember, brachial just means arm. And so we apply this pressure cuff, and we inflate it, and there's a point at which the pressure in the cuff is greater than the pressure in the artery. And at that point, it's basically acting like a tourniquet, cutting off all the blood downstream to the hand, the wrist, and so forth. And so as we begin to deflate that cuff, we can listen with a stethoscope for the sounds of blood squirting back to the lower arm. And that first instant where we begin to hear a little blood squirting past that cuff is what we call the systolic pressure. And again, a good systolic pressure is around 120 millimeters of mercury. And as we let off that blood pressure cuff, we'll continue to hear the squirting of blood through the stethoscope until we get to the diastolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is the residual pressure in the artery 
or the pressure at which the sphygmoid manometer is no longer impinging on the arterial wall. So once we drop below the diastolic pressure, we will no longer hear the heart sounds through our stethoscope. So you're going to learn how to measure both the systolic and diastolic blood pressure in lab next week. So as we said a couple slides back, mean arterial pressure, or MAP, is probably the most informative indicator about blood flow because it tells us most directly about tissue perfusion, that is, the supply of oxygen-rich blood to the tissues of the body. So ideally, mean arterial pressure should be above 80 millimeters of mercury. If it's below this level, it could indicate that tissues are inadequately perfused, and this could lead to hypoxia and acidosis and all kinds of bad things. And so if you have a patient whose mean arterial pressure is below 80, you definitely want to let the doctor know, and they'll begin to do some things that will hopefully raise that blood pressure above 80 millimeters of mercury. So another factor that affects blood flow is something called vascular resistance. And this is just the opposition to blood flow due to friction between the blood vessel walls and the blood. And it depends mainly on three factors. The first of these is lumen size. Remember the lumen was the large internal opening of any blood vessel. And so resistance will increase as the lumen size decreases. So if you can imagine a large artery with a large lumen versus a small artery with a small lumen which would have more vascular resistance. If you said the artery with a small lumen, you're correct. So lumen size is inversely proportional to vascular resistance. Another factor which influences resistance is something called blood viscosity. And this is basically just the thickness of blood. And so as the blood becomes thicker, the hematocrit or packed cell volume increases. And as it becomes thicker, it tends to have greater resistance. And so this resistance makes it harder to flow through the blood vessels. And finally, the last thing that affects vascular resistance is the length of blood vessels. So the longer the blood vessel is, the more friction will be generated by blood going through it, and usually the more blood will slow down. And so as you might guess, the longer the blood vessel, the more resistance, and so the harder the heart is going to have to pump to get blood through those blood vessels. And this is one reason why obesity is linked to hypertension, or greater than normal blood pressure. That is because obese people tend to have more body fat, and these body fat cells are being served by more capillaries. On average, each additional pound of fat will contain somewhere around 200 miles of additional capillaries. And so this additional length of blood vessel will cause additional vascular resistance. And this is going to cause the blood to slow down. So basically the heart is going to pump harder to get the blood through extra blood vessels because the resistance is so high. And this oftentimes results in hypertension or greater than normal blood pressure. So another factor that affects blood flow is something called venous return. Venous return, as the name implies, is simply the amount of blood traveling through the veins back to the heart. And so principally we're looking here at the amount of blood traveling through the superior and inferior vena cavas back to the right atrium. Now remember when it comes to veins, the heart is not really responsible for pumping blood throughout the veins. That is, the pressure generated by the heart was mostly lost in the process of crossing the capillary beds. And so the way that we increase venous return or get blood back to the heart is through two different factors. The first of these is called the skeletal muscle pump. And remember the skeletal muscle pump had to do with veins which cross through large muscle groups and when these muscle groups contracted they basically squeeze or milk the veins forcing blood back to the right atrium. Another factor that increases venous return is something called the respiratory pump. That is when you breathe in and out you create pressure differences in the abdomen that will also squeeze and milk the veins within your abdominal cavity helping to facilitate blood flow or venous return back to the heart. So both the respiratory pump and skeletal muscle pump were important for creating adequate amounts of venous return and getting blood to come back to the heart. Now normally your respiratory pump is working all the time because you're always breathing in and out. But your skeletal muscle pump can work more or less depending on the amount of muscular activity you're doing. If you're just sitting in your chair in class, you're actually probably moving your legs around a little bit, fidgeting a little bit, and that's helping to force blood back to your heart. Now on the other hand, if you're standing up on a parade ground at attention, trying to stand stock still, the amount of muscle contraction that you have is very, very low. As a result, the blood will tend to pool in the lower extremities and your systolic blood pressure will begin to drop. This is a phenomenon called orthostatic hypotension. And if your blood pressure drops too low, you can pass out, just like this guy. So orthostatic hypotension happens when there's not enough muscular contraction in the lower body to help milk that blood and force it back to the heart, causing more venous return. 
If we don't have enough venous return, then we're not going to be able to sustain blood pressure and perfusion to the tissues, and as a result, you pass out. And so that's why we tend to tell people that are standing stock still in a parade that they shouldn't lock their knees. They should actually contract and relax their muscles to help keep blood moving back to the heart through the process of the skeletal muscle pump. Another factor affecting blood flow is something called velocity. Velocity is basically the speed of the blood. So the velocity of blood tends to decrease as the total cross-sectional area of a blood vessel increases. And remember that the blood vessel with the greatest overall cross-sectional area, that is, as a whole for that blood vessel type, was actually the capillaries. Capillaries have very tiny lumens, but because we have so many capillaries, they represent the greatest overall cross-sectional area of blood vessels in the body. And so as a result, the blood tends to flow slowest through the capillaries and next slowest through the veins and fastest through the arteries. You can demonstrate this concept by taking a water hose and turning it on. If you don't have a spigot on that hose, you'll see that the water comes out at a nice sort of sloping angle. On the other hand, if you replace your thumb over the opening of that water hose, you would see that the velocity or speed of the water coming out would increase, as would the pressure. So remember we said before that although there are four factors that influence blood flow, blood pressure is probably the most easily accessible of these four factors. And so this screen shows two different groups of factors that can affect blood pressure. The first of these factors on the left hand side of the screen, that is the green boxes, happen to do with cardiac output. So anything that causes cardiac output to go up will also increase blood pressure. Whereas the blue boxes on the right side of the screen have to do with vascular resistance. That is, anything that increases vascular resistance is also going to tend to affect blood pressure. For example, let's go back to the boxes on the left side of the screen. You can see that increased blood volume can definitely have an effect on blood pressure because it increases venous return and also increases stroke volume. And so this is going to lead to increased blood pressure by increased cardiac output. So for example, having a greater than normal blood volume is definitely going to increase your blood pressure. Another thing that can increase blood pressure is increased heart rate or increased stroke volume. Remember that both heart rate and stroke volume are components of cardiac output. And so anything that increases these two factors is going to increase blood pressure. Now let's go to the right side of the screen and look at the factors that have to do with vascular resistance. So things that are going to increase vascular resistance are going to increase mean arterial pressure. And these include increases in hematocrit. Remember the hematocrit was the ratio of red blood cells to plasma. And as this number increases, the blood gets thicker and more viscous, and this increases resistance, which increases blood pressure. Another thing that will increase vascular resistance is obesity. Remember that for each pound of fat that you add to your body, you're also adding miles and miles of new blood vessels. And because these blood vessels have walls that slow the blood down, they will increase the amount of vascular resistance. And because they increase vascular resistance, you got it, they're also going to increase blood pressure. So as you can probably imagine, both blood pressure and blood flow are very important to the survival of the human body. And so it should be no surprise that we have a distinct area of the brain that is designed to monitor both blood flow and blood pressure throughout the body. And this area is called the cardiovascular control center, and it's located within the medulla oblongata of the brain. And this area of the brain receives nervous input from various areas of the body and will make complementary motor outputs to different areas of the body to adjust blood pressure and flow as needed. And so we're going to go through each of these in some detail. And so the cardiovascular control center of the medulla oblongata receives input from four different regions of the body. These include the higher brain centers, the proprioceptors, baroreceptors, and also chemoreceptors. We're going to go through both baroreceptors and chemoreceptors in separate slides, so I'll only talk about the higher brain centers and proprioceptors here. By higher brain center, I mean principally the cerebral cortex, that is the conscious area of the brain. And for example, if you can imagine watching a very scary movie and a movie that had your emotions on edge, this is going to cause increased numbers of sensory impulses from the cerebral cortex to the medulla oblongata, which will probably result in an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. On the other hand, proprioceptors are special sensory receptors found in joint capsules. 
and as you move your arms and legs about, your proprioceptors are going to be stimulated, causing an increase in sensory impulses from your proprioceptors to your medulla oblongata. This is basically going to tell your body that, hey, I must be exercising. I'm probably going to have increased oxygen demands here and also increased glucose demands, so I probably want to get the heart rate and blood pressure to increase to deal with these upcoming demands. And so increased proprioceptor stimulation will usually result in increased heart rate and cardiac output. Okay, another receptor type that is monitored by the cardiovascular control center is something called a baroreceptor. Remember the word baro means pressure. And so baroreceptors are monitoring the blood pressure within blood vessels. And so we have major baroreceptors within the carotid sinus and the carotid arteries and also within the aorta. And so these are measuring for differences in pressure. And remember, if we have a higher than normal pressure, that can be dangerous because that can lead to artery rupture or aneurysm. And if we have lower than normal pressure, that can be dangerous also because that can cause you to pass out. And so these baroreceptors are sending sensory nerve input to the medulla oblongata, which is making complementary adjustments to blood pressure to keep us within normal limits. For example, imagine what happens when the blood pressure falls below normal. The baroreceptors will send increased numbers of nerve impulses to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will then raise blood pressure by either increasing heart rate, increasing contractility, or increasing the contraction of blood vessels. Either of these three methods will help to increase blood pressure and restore it to normal levels. Let's look at the other hand. Let's say that your blood pressure is higher than it should be. As a result, the baroreceptors in your carotid sinus are stimulated. They're going to again signal the medulla oblongata, which in this case is going to reduce your blood pressure by reducing heart rate, reducing cardiac output, and maybe dilating blood vessels. So this is what we call the baroreceptor reflex, and it's a negative feedback reflex. That is, it normally brings us back to the set point for a controlled condition, which in this case is blood pressure. Now because we have these special baroreceptors within the aortic arch and also within the carotid sinus, we can use this knowledge to help to modify a person's blood pressure and cardiac output in times when it's excessive. For example, if you have somebody that's having atrial fibrillation or flutter and increased heart rate, we can slow down their heart by gently massaging the carotid sinus with the thumbs and this can get the heart rate and blood pressure to drop down to normal levels. Another type of nervous input received by the cardiovascular control center is through the input of chemoreceptors. As the name implies, chemoreceptors are monitoring chemicals in the blood. And chemoreceptors are found both in the carotid and aortic blood vessels. And the chemicals that we're monitoring here are usually going to increase when we have a higher than normal metabolic demand. For example, as the amount of CO2 increases or the amount of lactate increases, this is going to stimulate these chemoreceptors to send nerve impulses to our medulla oblongata that will increase both heart rate and blood pressure. Chemoreceptors also provide input to the respiratory areas of the brain and they help to stimulate increased breathing rate and depth during times of high metabolic demand. So now that we talked about the various types of sensory input that is monitored by the cardiovascular control center and the medulla oblongata, we're now going to talk about the ways in which it makes adjustments to heart rate, blood pressure, and so on. So the three different ways that the CV control center modifies blood pressure. The first of these is to either increase or decrease vagus stimulation. Remember the vagus nerve was a parasympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve impulses tend to slow the heart down. So the more parasympathetic nerve impulses, the slower the heart rate, and sometimes the lower the blood pressure. Whereas the more sympathetic nerve impulses, that's going to result in a faster heart rate and sometimes a greater stroke volume, and this will help to increase the blood pressure. And finally, we also have vasomotor nerves, which again are sympathetic nerves. When these are stimulated, this is going to cause blood vessels to constrict, and this constriction again is going to raise blood pressure. So anything that increases heart rate, increases contractility, or decreases blood vessel diameter is going to raise blood pressure. So just like other systems of the body, the cardiovascular system is affected both by nervous input as well as endocrine or hormonal input. So there are four major hormonal feedback mechanisms that regulate heart rate and blood pressure in the human body. The first of these is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and we're going to talk more about the system in an upcoming slide.
The second here is the adrenal medulla hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and these are catecholamine hormones that are going to both increase heart rate and contractility, both of which are going to increase blood pressure and cardiac output. The third hormone here is ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. Remember, ADH was secreted by the posterior pituitary in times of dehydration, and it helps to increase or maintain blood volume. So administration of ADH is going to help either raise or at least stabilize blood pressure because it ensures that we maintain or add to our blood volume because it reduces water loss in the kidneys. The fourth hormone is one you have not seen so far, and it's called ANP, otherwise known as atrial natriuretic peptide. An atrial natriuretic peptide is secreted by the walls of the heart atrium when they are distended by a greater than normal blood volume. And basically, atrial natriuretic peptide causes the body to increase its amount of naturesis and thereby increase the water loss in the urine. And so AMP is a hormone that helps to reduce blood pressure by reducing blood volume. So just a reminder that your body has an ideal set point for blood pressure. That is, ideally it should be around 120 millimeters systolic and 80 millimeters of mercury diastolic. And the cardiovascular region of your brain is monitoring this pressure and making adjustments. And so there's two possibilities that could happen. Our blood pressure could go way too high, in which case we could risk rupturing a blood vessel, or our blood pressure could go way too low, in which case we could go into shock. So we're going to focus on shock first. Shock results from inadequate blood flow and blood pressure in the body. And it's caused by a failure of the cardiovascular system to deliver enough blood and oxygen to the tissues that need it. And it results in these tissues becoming both hypoxic, that is low in oxygen, and also they're going to have an increase in CO2. They're going to become hypercapnic and have buildup of lactic acid. So shock has some very distinctive telltale signs. And when I talk about shock here, I mean physiological shock, not somebody being, oh, I'm shocked this has happened or I'm shocked that that happened. But real shock is a very dangerous condition because we have systolic blood pressure plummeting, usually being less than 90 millimeters of mercury. And that's important because that pressure is insufficient to maintain perfusion to the tissues. The other thing we'll notice with people that are in shock is that they have a high resting heart rate or a rapid fluttering pulse. And this is because one of the things that the heart does in order to compensate for the lack of blood pressure is to try to beat more quickly to drive blood pressure up. Another symptom of shock is somebody that has a very pale skin and this is caused by something called sympathetic constriction. If you remember to the beginning of the lecture, we said that the skin was this huge reservoir for blood, that it had lots of veins in it, and these veins are storing around 60% of the blood in your body. So when your blood pressure crashes, one of the things that will happen is the veins and arteries and arterioles in your skin will reflexively contract to force all that blood back into the core circulation that is going to the heart, the kidneys, the brain. And so this will result in people with sheet white skin. They basically look like death. And once you've seen it, you'll never confuse it for anything else. Another symptom of shock is an altered mental state. Frequently, people that are in shock are somewhat confused and often a little bit angry. Another symptom of shock, which isn't very useful, is decreased urine production. Usually shock is an acute state that happens very, very quickly, so chances are you're not going to be monitoring somebody's urine output during a shock episode. So I really don't like this one. Finally, two other symptoms of shock include both thirst and acidosis. Thirst is something that can be easily recognized by people around the victim. The person may ask for water. Uh, depending on whether or not they may lose consciousness, you may or may not want to give that water. But definitely thirst is a symptom of shock. And finally, the last symptom of shock that usually cannot be directly observed by personnel is acidosis. That is because the tissues have low perfusion, that is they're not receiving enough blood, they become hypoxic and as a result they also become hypercapnic. And so we're going to see a rise in blood lactate levels as well as CO2 levels which is going to shift blood pH downwards. So acidosis is a symptom of shock but it really can only be measured if you're measuring their blood electrolytes and blood chemistry. And so every year when I ask my students how many people have actually seen shock in a patient or in a friend of theirs, I'm always surprised that it's only been one or two people. 
And so I went on the internet searching for pictures of shock, and unfortunately, I only found pictures like this, and the rest of the pictures on the internet just showed people with their hands to their face showing how shocked they were at their low car prices or something like that. So physiological shock can be described by this picture here, although not very well. So remember, their eyes are going to be lackluster, their pupils are going to be dilated, because think more sympathetic nerve impulses. Breathing is going to be shallow but rapid, and the skin is going to be pale and maybe a little bit clammy. Remember that paleness comes from vasoconstriction of blood vessels within the skin to force that blood back down into the main circulation. And finally, you're going to notice a very rapid, thready pulse. And this rapid, thready pulse is happening because the heart is trying to compensate by pumping blood more quickly in order to get blood pressure to go back up. So remember that shock is a lower than normal blood pressure, and we tend to divide shock into one of four categories based on the cause. The first of these is hypovolemic shock, and as the name implies, this happens to do with a lower than normal blood volume. And hypovolemic shock can happen, let's say, in times of dehydration, or if somebody's had a massive hemorrhage and a lot of blood loss. Both of these can result in hypovolemic shock. Another type of shock is something called cardiogenic shock, Cardiogenic shock happens because the heart is no longer pumping efficiently, and so we're not able to maintain blood flow and perfusion to the tissues. The third type of shock is called vascular shock, and it occurs when blood vessels in the body inappropriately dilate or enlarge, thereby dropping blood pressure. And vascular shock can be divided into one of three subcategories. The first of these is anaphylactic shock, and this is one you're probably familiar with. Basically, certain allergens in the environment can trigger an immune response which causes people's blood vessels to inappropriately dilate, thereby cause vascular shock. Another type of vascular shock, called neurogenic shock, is caused by damage to the central nervous system, that is the brain or spinal cord. And finally, septic shock is caused by a release of bacterial proteins or toxins which again stimulate the blood vessels to inappropriately dilate, thereby causing blood pressure to bottom out. The fourth type of shock is called obstructive shock, and this again happens to do not so much with the heart, but with obstructions of the great blood vessels, that is, the pulmonary artery or the aorta. And anything like a thrombus or an embolus that blocks these blood vessels is going to cause an obstructive shock, thereby reducing blood pressure and blood flow in the rest of the body. So remember that shock is a lower than normal blood pressure that's going to result in lower than normal tissue perfusion. And so the body's going to respond or try to compensate for this shock by activating the following three systems. The first of these is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Remember, renin is an enzyme that helps to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, and that's going to cause vasoconstriction, which should raise blood pressure. And aldosterone is a hormone which is going to help to retain sodium and other ions in the blood, and that's going to also lead to an increase in blood volume, which should also lead to an increase in blood pressure. Secondly, we're going to have an increase in the secretion of ADH. Remember, ADH is secreted from the posterior pituitary, and it basically helps the kidneys to retain water so that they can maintain blood volume. And finally, the third thing the body's going to do is activate the sympathetic nervous system. That is, we're going to have sympathetic nerve impulses arising from our medulla oblongata, and these are going to stimulate our heart to beat more quickly and also more forcefully. We'll also have release of adrenaline from the adrenal medulla, which will increase the contractility and the rate of heart contraction. So whereas hypotension was a lower than normal blood pressure, hypertension is a higher than normal blood pressure. We say that somebody is hypertensive if they have sustained systolic blood pressure above 140 millimeters of mercury or sustained diastolic blood pressure above 90 millimeters of mercury. And it's important that we make several observations of a person's blood pressure before we diagnose them as being hypertense. For example, if you walk into the doctor's office and sit down one day and they determine your blood pressure is, let's say, 140 over 90, they can't say that you're hypertense based on that one reading. We have to do serial readings over a period of different days and see that, at rest, your heart rate and blood pressure have to be above normal limits in order to diagnose you as hypertensive. On the other hand, we may also diagnose you as prehypertensive if your blood pressure values are above normal values, that is above 120 over 80, but not yet at the cutoff for hypertension, 140 over 90.
The reason that we monitor for hypertension is that prolonged hypertension is the major cause for heart failure, vascular disease, kidney failure, and also stroke. We classify hypertension into one of two types, primary and secondary. Secondary hypertension is the most rare, and it's due to the obstruction of arteries, kidney disease, and endocrine disorders, for example, hyperthyroid. On the other hand, primary hypertension is most common and can be attributed to a myriad of factors. For example, people that are obese or get very little exercise may have primary hypertension. Also, primary hypertension is quite high among smokers because nicotine causes vasoconstriction of the arteries. Now we're going to go over some of the treatments for hypertension. One of the most effective but yet low-tech treatments is diet and exercise. Remember that every pound of body fat you add to your body adds miles and miles of extra blood vessels. and These extra blood vessels increase peripheral resistance which raises blood pressure. And so one way to reduce blood pressure is to lose weight. And so by losing weight, we can reduce those extra blood vessels and return our blood pressure to normal. Another way to reduce blood pressure is to quit smoking. Remember that nicotine is a potent vasoconstrictor. That is, it causes release of epinephrine, which causes constriction of blood vessels, which causes increased vascular resistance. This is going to raise blood pressure. So by quitting smoking, we can drastically lower blood pressure in a short amount of time. Of course, there are also pharmaceutical treatments for hypertension as well. These include diuretics like Lasix, and diuretics help to reduce blood pressure by reducing blood volume. They cause excretion of excess fluids from the kidneys into the urine, and this excess fluid is coming out of the blood, and so by reducing the blood volume, we also reduce blood pressure. Another type of drug is the beta blockers, and the beta blockers block epinephrine from having its full effects on the heart. So remember, epinephrine is a catecholamine hormone, and it usually stimulates an increase in heart rate and also contractility. And so when using beta blockers, this blocks the effects of epinephrine on the heart, thereby lowering cardiac output and reducing blood pressure. And finally, another way we can reduce hypertension is through the use of ACE inhibitors. Remember that ACE stood for angiotensin converting enzyme, and it was an enzyme that helped us convert an inactive form of angiotensin, angiotensin 1, into the active form, angiotensin 2. And remember, angiotensin is a hormone that causes constriction of blood vessels, which of course increases vascular resistance and raises blood pressure. And so if we can stop that enzyme, we can also help to lower blood pressure by reducing vascular resistance.